Good evening, welcome. I'm Nicola Longford, the Executive Director here at the Sixth Form Museum. And I'm thrilled to welcome this stellar group from the Dallas Theatre Centre. We've been working with them for a number of months in uh, preparing a range of community conversations about the transition um, from LBJ um, becoming vice, from Vice President to President of the United States. And tonight this will be a real treat. These are three gentlemen who have um, know of each other but have not yet met before until today. And Stephen, I want to congratulate Stephen. I hope that you will join me in a huge round of applause because this is his first program that he is moderating as curator, full curator. <laughs> Stephen has worked with the museum for almost 15 years and um, he's got the most fabulous job um, interviewing such fascinating people as you're going to um, hear tonight. Uh, before I pass the microphone over to, to Jeff Woodward, of the Dallas Theatre Centre. If it were not for the Dallas Theatre Centre, we would not be having such engaging community conversations about a difficult piece of history. And these conversations are really geared for a Dallas audience. Most of you know that the Sixth Floor Museum welcomes hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world, and mostly outside Texas. About 40% of our visitors are from Texas, but very few from Dallas proper. So I'm very pleased to see all of you here, and we hope that this will continue to encourage you to think about your piece of history and your place in it. So um, please join me now in welcoming yeah, Jeff Woodward. Good evening, and um, just want to say how much uh, everybody at Dallas Theater Center appreciates um, our partnership with the Sixth Floor Museum. This has been a terrific collaboration, and I think this is our third panel discussion that we've had here at the museum. Uh, in addition, uh, we have over a thousand high school students uh, from all over Texas that come to see our productions. It's a program called Project Discovery. And all of those students have been coming to the Sixth Floor Museum uh, before they come to see the play. Uh, so that's been a really wonderful component to this collaboration. Uh, I just want to say a couple of things about the production. Um, all the Way is a, a relatively new play by Robert Schenken, who's a Texas uh, playwright. He grew up in Austin, uh, Texas. Uh, the play uh, was originally commissioned by the Oregon Shakespeare Festival uh, and then ended up on Broadway and uh, was very well received. And we're pleased uh, to be mounting a, a production in Texas with the Alley Theater, which is the other leading theater in the state of Texas. The production opened in Houston. Uh, about six weeks or so ago. It's been here for a couple of weeks um, and it's doing extremely well. And so um, I want to encourage you all, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, to come see it. I think there's a coupon in your in the handout that gives you even a discount. Um, we're selling like hotcakes and we've actually extended uh, <coughs> an additional week. So there are two more weeks uh, to see the show. Um, I'm now pleased uh, to introduce uh, uh, Brandon Potter, who is a member of the Briarly Acting Company. We are fortunate here to have a resident company of actors who work with us uh, throughout the season. Uh, Brandon is playing um, LBJ, and I'm pl very pleased to introduce him. Hi, everybody. I'm Brandon Potter. Uh, like Jeff said, I'm a member of the Diane and Hal Briarly Resident Acting Company at Dallas Theater Center, and I'm LBJ in our production of All the Way. Uh, so you're talking about his transition to power today. And there are a few bits in the play where he deals with that. Um, he has to woo, say, for example, uh, Robert McNamara to stay on board, to stay in his cabinet, because he wanted to keep his cabinet intact. Uh, but no uh, piece of the play says it as concisely as uh, his address to the Senate floor. Uh, and I'll just share a little bit of that with you today. All I have. I would have given gladly not to be standing here today. The greatest leader of our time was struck down by the foulest deed of our time. No words are sad enough to express our sense of loss. John F. Kennedy told his countrymen that our national work would not be done during the life of this administration, nor perhaps in our lifetimes. But, he said, let us begin. Today, I would say to my fellow Americans, let us continue. We have talked long enough in this country about civil rights. We have talked for a hundred years or more. It is time now to write the next chapter in the books of law. 
I urge you again, as I did in 57 and again in 60, to enact a civil rights law so that we can move to eliminate from this nation every trace of discrimination that is based upon race or color. So that is a, an abbreviated version of his entire Senate speech. <laughs> But I, I think it does get to the heart of what he wanted, which was to continue <laughs> what JFK was doing. Uh, I'll let uh, these guys take it over from here. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here tonight at the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza. As Nicholas said, I'm Stephen Fagan, the curator here. And we have a fantastic panel. Uh, each of these gentlemen, they've each done individual programs, but it's always exciting when we bring groups of diverse individuals together to share a common story. These men all lived through the events of November 22nd, 1963 and the aftermath in their own way, uh, in their unique professions, and yet bringing them here together, we get a sense to listen in on history and see what was going on at the time in their minds and in the interactions they had with each other without actually knowing each other at the time. So we're going to be privy to that uh, private conversation today. You all have programs which give biographies of our speakers, and rather than go through that biography again, I would like to introduce them via their 1963 Persona. So let us take a look. Seated right next to me is Julian Reed, and you see him here at Parkland Memorial Hospital on November 22, 1963. Julian was the press aide to Governor Connolly, had worked with Governor Connolly since 1962, and went on to, uh, to be an insider in Texas politics for decades. So he's our insider political perspective tonight as we look at this transition from President Kennedy to President Johnson. Seated next to Julian, we have J. Walter Coughlin, who's the largest individual in this photograph. He was a Secret Service agent on the White House detail for both President Kennedy and then, starting November 22nd, President Johnson. He later was part of the protective detail for Vice President Hubert Humphrey. And on the end of our panel tonight, we have Eamon Kennedy, who was a staff photographer at the Dallas Times-Herald in 1963 and took some of the most remarkable photographs that weekend at Dallas Love Field, at Parkland Hospital, at the Texas Theater when Lee, after Lee Harvey Oswald's arrest, and at uh, Dallas Police Headquarters over that weekend. Many of the signature images from that weekend came from the lens and the camera of Eamon Kennedy. So what an extraordinary group of individuals we have to share in this community conversation tonight. And it's all about these two men, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson. Uh, Walt, I want to start with you because out of everyone in this room, you clearly knew Kennedy the longest, worked with him the longest. Give us a sense, as an agent on the White House detail, what was he like to work for and protect? He was wonderful to work for. He was hard to protect uh, <laughs> because he was so popular with the, uh, with the public that they just wanted to touch him, be near him, and uh, be a part of this Camelot experience. Uh, as far as him personally, he was friendly. He knew all of our first names. He invited us uh, into his home at Christmas. We gave us all presents. He was just a wonderful person to work with and to work for. The picture we're looking at here uh, sort of captures it all. It's you there uh, at the bottom with President Kennedy, Vice President Johnson. We see Lady Bird there. And at the top of the stairs, we see Texas Governor John Connolly. We're going to hear more about him in a minute now. One of my favorite things to do with, with images from the Kennedy White House is play a game called Where's Walt? And so we're going to do that tonight and find Walt in a few of these pictures. Here's the Oval Office. This is August of 1962. And there's Walt Coughlin in the background with President Kennedy. Now, you described President Kennedy before as a very personable individual who knew all your names. Um, Tell us a, a one or two personal experiences, interactions that you had with him that are particularly memorable to you here uh, half a century later. That was a long time ago, so at my <laughs> age, maybe my memory fails me a bit. But uh, I think one of the nicest memories I have is when uh, we, he took a trip to Europe, and I was on what they call the advanced team, making the preparations two weeks ahead of his visit <laughs> in Berlin, Germany. And at that time, that the Cold War was on, and the Berlin Wall was standing. We had a 32-mile motorcade. And the reception that man got on that trip, and particularly in Germany, uh, was just amazing. On the downtown plots, the, the square, there was over a million people heard his speech. And he was just phenomenal. He was a great speaker. He, uh, he spoke uh, some German that day. Uh, and he was just loved by every place we went, from Germany. Then we went on to 
Ireland, where obviously he was well well liked. Uh, we had a lot of fun in Ireland. Uh, he visited his sister's grave, uh, and it just historically it was just a wonderful time to be around him. Uh, the the the, uh, the problems later on in his in his uh, administration came up with the Cuban Missile Crisis and so on. But we might get to that later. But he was just a joy to work with. In this picture, we see you again circled here, and there's the Kennedy family, uh, Jacqueline and the two children, Caroline and John Jr. Did you spend a lot of time with the rest of the family besides the president? Well, I didn't. I was not assigned to the children, but they were always around because they were so small. That picture is taken in Middleburg, Virginia. They had a farm, a horse farm, down at what they call Glen Ara in Virginia, and he spent most every weekend down there. Uh, Jackie loved to ride the horses, and... Uh, he would just he would fly down in his helicopter every weekend, and she spent a lot of time down there because she really uh, she she just wanted to get away from the White House at times for her own enjoyment and the things she liked to do. Uh, but that's coming out of church at uh, at Middleburg, Virginia, with the with John, John, and Caroline. And you can see on the the date there at the top of the picture, October twenty seventh, nineteen sixty three. So this is less than one month before these events here in Dallas. Now, this was a very different era. Dwight Eisenhower was the oldest president in American history up to that time. Uh, John F. Kennedy, the youngest president, elected the, the first president born in the 20th century with the young kids in the White House. Walt, did you feel like you were part of a, a, an exciting and historic moment in history? Definitely. Definitely. Camelot was really fun. It, uh, the people, uh, he, he was a guy, they either loved him or didn't like him at all. There was nothing in between with him. Uh, there was a lot of anti-Catholic sentiment about him, but uh, we never saw much of that. Uh, the crowds were very difficult to handle. They just loved to be around him. They loved to touch him. Uh, they loved to see Jackie. And uh, the kids, of course, were important to the, to the public. And they had uh, just, uh, he was exciting to be around. He, he, every time we saw a crowd, they just, they really went crazy for him. And, uh, from a security standpoint, he was very difficult because he liked to just jump right in the middle of things and say hi to everyone. But uh, he was also reasonable. You could talk to him about some problems. And uh, there were cases where we knew there might be a problem, so we'd say, you know, let's not do that. He would usually agree. But uh, he, was, he was just a joy. And that was my first assignment at the White House. And uh, I had spent a little bit of time with Eisenhower earlier. But Eisenhower was nice, but it, to say, you know, the nicest thing I could think of was kind of boring. Uh, <laughs> he was a general first, last, and always. And uh, everyone else was at best a sergeant, and uh, I was a private. But, uh, <laughs> but the thing is, he was such a change from Eisenhower. He was personable and friendly, and uh, the country really came to life under, under his presidency. Julian Reed, let's talk to you for a moment about this lovely couple, John and Nellie Connolly. You knew them for decades. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, the political the political overview of Texas at that time. Uh, maybe start with the 1960 election, Kennedy versus Nixon. Well, of course, uh, in 1960 in Texas, uh, he was, uh, uh, Kennedy was not that well loved, as you can imagine, uh, because uh, of, of a lot of things, but he, he didn't have a popular following, I'd say that. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, uh, he won, mm -hmm. you know. And Texas was slow to come along to warm to Kennedy. Uh, Democrats, of course, uh, were pretty strong for him, but uh, that wasn't the case uh, with, with the general community, particularly the business community. And that was echoed when... Uh, uh, Governor Conley later on arranged for non-political events. He wanted to introduce him as a non-political figure, and he was trying to get him to be better accepted at that time. Uh, but Governor Conley and Ms. Conley were, at that time, they were getting ready to run in 1960. Governor Conley was appointed Secretary of the Navy. By Kennedy. By, by Kennedy, and the two of them were friends. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very close. 
Uh, but Governor Connolly was getting ready to run, and that was when I got involved with him in 1962 to work on his original campaign. Yeah, and uh, he, he, of course, won as governor of Texas. And so he was in a good position when the uh, the kickoff sort of to the 1964 re-election campaign began. He was crucial right. to, to shoring up support. Uh -huh. Now, now. Julian, the reasons given for the trip to Texas in 1963 was that Kennedy was coming down here to mend fences within the different factions of the Democratic Party. But you have a very different perspective on that. Well, that was a nice cover story. <laughs> but uh, the fact is that uh, President Kennedy had been wanting to come to Texas ever since he was elected. And he had told Lyndon several times he wanted to come, and they kept putting him off because, number one, he wasn't that popular. And number two, they had the vice president had a lot on his plates. He didn't want to be out front. you got to remember this, that, that, that Johnson was always in the middle between liberals and conservatives, and he wasn't anxious to use any of his capital with this conservative part of the Democratic Party so they kept postponing it. Uh, they, they, Kennedy used to say, or supposedly he said, Lyndon, I want to go to Texas and set some of that rich Texans money. He <laughs> had it in his head that everybody in Dallas, in Texas, Dallas almost, everybody in Texas was rich, and he wanted to go down and get some of that money. And he kept pushing to come down here. The White House originally planned and wanted to do a five-city tour, five political fundraisers. And Governor Connolly said, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that. And now Connolly was trying to help him, but he said, you don't want to come down here. It looks like you want to rape the state for money. So Governor Connolly, that's what the staff wanted in the White House. Governor Connolly had a different concept. He told Millie Connolly, if the Texans see Kennedy, up close and listen to him and get to know him, they will like him. So he wanted to get past their conceptions, in other words, their own people's own, you know, their own view of him without knowing him. And that's why he came up with the concept of having four nonpartisan events and only one political event, and that was in, that was in Austin. And finally they agreed to that. But, but that was a picture. The mm -hmm. picture in Texas was very, very not, not, pro-Kennedy at that time. Uh, in fact, he wasn't in good shape poll-wise in Texas at that time. You may remember that Vice President Johnson was a key force in his winning election in 1960. And the general thought was that if Kennedy did not have Johnson on the ticket in 1964, he was most likely not going to win. We're looking at a picture of the Kennedys uh, the day before the assassination in Houston. Now, uh, <laughs> Prior to Houston, they had been to San Antonio, and, and Walt, you did advance work in San Antonio. Pretty straightforward? Yes, it was a very simple stop from my behalf <laughs> because he dedicated the Cooker Army Hospital in San Antonio. So it was on a military base. It was only military invitees and the families of military personnel. So it was not a problem. Uh, he left me about 4 o'clock in the afternoon to fly to Houston and to Fort Worth. And... Uh, I saw him, and he thanked me, and she thanked me for the trip. Things went well, very quiet. Uh, and uh, I saw him about uh, about 18 hours before he was killed. Now, there, there wasn't concern in San Antonio or really the other cities, but there was a little bit of concern about Dallas. There was a lot of concern about Dallas. In fact, uh, there were people that recommended he not even come to Texas. And uh, I was not a privy to any of that stuff, but I know it. <coughs> Uh, but uh, he, there, was, there was a lot of problems in Texas because they just didn't like him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, we had had, before I came to Texas for, the, for his visit, I had, gone, I had done uh, the preparations in Miami about two weeks before that, and it was horrendous because uh, he was going to come in by car. We had to bring him by helicopter because there were so many Cuban refugees that were just angry with him. And they wanted to get back into Cuba, and it was just, it was a mess. It was a very difficult trip. Uh, I was, that was the most frightened I had been as an advance agent trying to protect him in Miami because uh, it was coming from all sides. And uh, he, thank goodness he got out of there that night, but uh, 
it was a very, very scary night. And then two weeks later was the tragedy in Texas. Now, Eamon, you're working in Dallas at the time, at the, at the Times Herald as a staff photographer. How would you characterize uh, politically the mood of the city uh, as, we, as we make our way into the president's visit in November of 63? Well, the, the newspaper I worked for looked upon Kennedy very favorably, but I think the public in general, they, they were basically anti-Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, th I think there were some posters out charging him with treason. Yeah, the wanted for treason flyers. Yeah. and Yeah, so it, it, was a, it wasn't a good situation for him. Mm -hmm. were, were, were any of you, all three of you, were any of you concerned for his safety, genuinely concerned that there might be some sort of violence in Dallas? I wasn't. I, I didn't think what happened was possible. But the, the Secret Service happened. was concerned about the stop. They were concerned about the entire trip. Yeah. Julian? Well, I think, I think there was concern, but I don't think it was you know, to the degree that we expected anything really bad, you know, maybe some demonstrations. One of the reasons why there was concern about it <clears throat> in some circles was that twice, there had, two times there had been incidents. Uh, one was when LBJ and Mrs. Johnson campaigned in 1960, and uh, they, according to the news reports, were spat upon downtown Dallas. And then only about a month or a month and a half prior to the trip, uh, and Adelaide Stevenson, Ambassador Stevenson, spoke uh, in in Dallas and was struck with some some woman's umbrella, I guess. Anyway, that was the basic story. So all this kind of fed into the narrative, mm -hmm. and you got to remember that we had some genuine nuts down here, like General Edwin Walker, uh, who were very well had high profile. The dialogue of Dallas, the political dialogue at that point was dominated by the real extreme group, a small group, of, a small group of voices, but the combined chorus of them created what was called a hatred, a, a, a community of a mood of hatred down here. Mm -hmm. That was so bad that you mentioned that people were warning him not to come. Uh, no one less than Stanley Marcus, one of the founders of Neiman Marcus, wrote a letter to the president and urged him not to come. So there was obviously was concern, but I think, I think after, from from the planner's standpoint, they had confidence in Secret Service and the local people. You know, they felt they had it under control, so they were concerned, but not unduly alarmed. I guess would be the best way to characterize it. But things are going well for the Texas trip. Here we have a picture that morning, November twenty second, in Fort Worth. Uh, <laughs> Julian of the of, of the. The panelist here, you were there that day. You were there at the parking lot speech outside and then the uh, Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. breakfast. And things are really looking up. In fact, you, you change your plans. Things I are did. going so well. I would say that unquestionably that was the high point of the trip. Uh, they had been to Houston the night before, as you've already talked about. They were in San Antonio. Started out in San Antonio. Then they flew to Houston uh, for a fundraising event. Not theirs, though. It was for Albert Thomas who was then the chair of the uh, Democratic uh, Ways and Means Committee, I think, I believe that was it. Anyway, it was celebrating him, and that's where Jackie spoke in Spanish to a group of Latin Americans, and the, the crowd just went crazy, as you can imagine. They flew into Fort Worth the night that night, after they got through in Houston, got in about 11 o'clock at night out at Carswell Air Force Base, military base outside Fort Worth, and uh, the crowd even at 11 o'clock at night, they're a big crowd, Greet them out there and all the way in on the roadway that people be on the side of the road. They arrived at the old Hotel Texas in downtown Fort Worth, which is now Hilton, and there was a big crowd waiting for them there. So they retired that evening, and next we had planned this nonpartisan again, a nonpartisan ch Chamber of Commerce breakfast. And it was sold out. Now, this, here's the hypocrisy and the attitudes I talked to you about. The business community was basically opposed to him, but they all sure as hell wanted to come see him. <laughs> they particularly wanted to come see Jackie. The women did. So this is a paradox. Because the majority of those tickets were controlled by the chamber, the people who elected the president didn't get tickets. And they were miffed about it, as you can imagine. They were furious about it. 
And so they went to work and raising all kinds of problems about it. And Jim Wright, who was a congressman from Tarrant County at that time, and who was a big Kennedy supporter, he prevailed on them, on them to add an event prior to the breakfast. The breakfast was not originally in the plan at all. But after much concern about the, the anger of the public, they put out, added an event before the breakfast. We're talking about uh, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning on a parking lot uh, across the street from the Hilton Hotel or from the Texas Hotel. <clears throat> there were 5,000 people on that lot that morning in a misting rain. Unbelievable. So that picture you showed earlier of them coming out of the Hotel Texas uh, with all the power, Vice President Johnson was there, John Conley, the governor of Texas. Uh, if you look in this picture, you'll also see Ralph Yarbrough, the liberal senator. senator. Uh, you'll see uh, Jim Wright. Mm -hmm. You'll see uh, Don Kennard, who was a state senator. The power of Texas politically were all next to the next to Kennedy. You'll notice that most of them are wearing rain gear. The president was not. He was not. So, and Jim Wright was not. Well, this was a pandemonium. I mean, everybody was happy, joyous. Uh, it was, I think, the high point of the trip, by all means. I want to take us on to Dallas. We need to get to Love Field. And, Eamon, this is where your photos begin because you were out there to cover the president. What a fantastic picture this is right here. Tell us a little bit about the mood that day as you took these photographs at Love Field? Well, the, the crowd were overly enthusiastic, and, uh, and there was lots of people. And, How'd uh, you take this picture? Well, you, you're working in a very tight area. You've got, your, you've got the Secret Service pushing you this way and that way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you did. Some of your buddies. But um, basically, you had to hold the camera over your head. And, and figure out where, where the image was and shoot that way. So you took this picture without looking through the viewfinder That's of your right. camera? Yeah, just, just aiming the camera. Great job. It, Pretty it, extraordinary. It takes a little practice to do that because <laughs> <laughs> you can't hold the camera steady uh -huh. over your head as you could pressed against your forehead. Yeah, and I've seen some other pictures. You, you had a cigarette in your hand while you were doing all this as well. Well, I was, I was very... Um, uh, ambidextrous. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because uh, everyone smoked back then. Yeah. Another another great photograph. Now, now looking at a picture like this, Walt, you you weren't at Love Field that day, but does a picture like this just make you nervous? Yes. Yeah, it does. You know, because that's a that's a public. Uh, those people were not checked in. No one knew who no. they were. They just showed up. It was a general public. Yeah. No metal and, detectors or anything like that back right. then. Right. And what it gets down to is. Politics and security is like oil and water. Well, you know, it just doesn't jive. And he has to get reelected, so he has to touch the people. And our job is to try to keep him alive or safe. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a difficult thing. Now, this picture of Eamon's, I want to point out, this picture is not cropped in any way. This is the full frame that Eamon shot. And Eamon, you call this the well, last portrait. I, I believe it is. This, uh, I took this right before he got the limousine. And I position myself to get in front of him. And then, as he was coming towards me, I said, hold it. And, and he stopped. And that's when I said, I only got one frame, but that's when I got that picture. Wow. And then he got in the limousine. So that would be the last close-up on Kennedy. Yeah. Nice. Now, you stay at the airport, Eamon, because you're you're really there to cover the arrival and the departure later right, that day. Exactly. So we'll we'll revisit you later because after the assassination your plans went out the window. But Julian, you got on board the White House press bus here in the parade and you were actually an eyewitness to those moments here in Dealey Plaza. Tell us about that. Well I was on that White House press bus representing Governor Connolly. I had done a lot of political work for Governor Connolly, so he was the host. Excuse me. He was the official host for this trip. So I was interacting, representing him on the bus. Malcolm Kilduff was a press officer for that trip. So I was assisting, just hosting the guys. And it was a who's who of the press. It was the who's who of the giants of that hour. You look at a, I have a book out on this that has in the back a, a listing of all the people on that 
on that trip who were on the White House press plan. It's a who's who today, if you look back on it. Anyway, yes, I was on the bus, and we were coming through downtown Dallas. Uh, the crowd that you described there obviously was in, intelligent, but, but starting from Love Field, coming down, down, they came down Love Field, I mean, Love, from Love Field on Lemon Avenue to downtown Dallas, and the crowds became larger the closer they got to downtown, as you can imagine. So they finally came downtown, got onto Main Street. We're coming around Main Street toward Dealey Plaza, and you could look up, and people were hanging out of the windows, all the skyscrapers. They were six or seven feet deep on either side of the road. Just unbelievable. So we came all the way down to the end of the street, to Houston Street, where it turns, where the bus turns, where the whole cavalcade turns. We got to about the press bus, just about the middle of that block, about the seventh or eighth car in the caravan. The caravan was ahead of us. The limousine had made the turn to pass underneath the school book depository. I happened to have a seat right in the front right of the bus, that portion that is flat against the wall, you know, in most buses. I happened to have a direct view across the driver down to Dealey Plaza. And everybody was very jocular. Everybody was having a good time. The press was laughing about, well, you know, everybody's worried about this trip. How could it be any better? Uh, that had just turned the corner, Mrs. Connolly in her book describes that she had just heard, she had just turned to the president and said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. And that instant, pow, 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 I heard the shots. And we first thought for a moment, maybe it was backfire, <coughs> motorcycles, because we had motorcycles on either side of us, about two or three deep. And then I could see all of a sudden people throwing their kids down on the grass, parents throwing their youngster down on the grass. The limousine stopped, hesitated just a moment, and then rushed ahead immediately. So that was, that was the start of the nightmare. And, of course, the motorcade rushes to Parkland Hospital. Eamon, you find out about the assassination just as you're sitting down for lunch at the airport? Yes, we, I was with uh, Bob Fenley, the reporter I was working with. Bob Fenley. And yeah. we, uh, we decided to have lunch before he came back. And we just sat down and were trying to order, and the waitress told us that she thought the Kennedy had been shot. So, so, so off we, you... We confirmed it, and uh, we were one of the first people at Parkland. Yeah. No lunch for you, you're off to the no. hospital. <laughs> And some more pictures that you took. And these, perhaps, are even more iconic today than even your pictures of the president at Love Field. Pictures of, of pensive, anxious people waiting outside. A mix of folks that were actually getting treated at Parkland that were rushed out of the emergency room when the president arrived. And we see some, some interns and orderlies there. And you turn your camera on the crowd. It was, it was chaos, basically. Um, especially when they announced that the president was dead. It, it turned uh, chaotic. So people are hearing this on car and transistor radios, and this is the raw emotional was, reaction. I think was, I'm not sure there was transistor radios back then. They were brand new. Were they? Yeah. But the, the word got out, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the crowd reacted, as you can see, uh, dramatically. And you uh, took one, little, one picture of this little girl. One frame, and that turned out to be... Uh, it was cropped differently, but that ran, I think, on probably every newspaper in the world. Yeah. Uh, one of the things, as a photographer, you're supposed to get the names, and I didn't get, there wasn't time to get names, but uh, she, uh, she came into the newspaper to get some copies, and, and Vivian Castlebury, who's here today, uh, was able to identify who she was, and... Uh, her name was Kathy Atkinson. Kathy Atkinson. And she, here you are with Kathy. Yeah. She posing with that paper. And nice. you mentioned that Vivian Castleberry was the one that brought her identity to your attention. And Vivian, right. wave to us here. Everyone's, you are the grandmother attention. of Dallas journalism right here. Yeah. 
uh, Vivian and I worked for many years together. So. And, and Eamon, your picture of this little girl at Parkland Hospital really changed her life. Well, she wrote a book and uh, went on speaking tours. And she did, and she did a fundraiser for the Kennedy Library, yeah. and, and uh, mm -hmm. she became very actively involved in helping to preserve the president's memory and legacy, all because of the fame she achieved in that picture of yours from, from Parkland Hospital. Great really story. extraordinary. We have another picture here, and here we have the 36th president of the United States. Situation de facto, he is now the president. President Kennedy's passed away. I, th I think that's probably the first picture of him. And, and he is on his way. He's on his way back to the airport for this what? historic picture right here. Um, I know we left you, Julian, at the hospital. We're going to come back to that. But, Eamon, you have one more story about this day um, that I want to touch on because you were there. You were right outside. Well, I was <laughs> outside trying to get inside. They, uh, strangely enough, and I, I don't know why they'd be interested, in it, but National Geographic uh, called me and s said that they wanted, in the worst way, to have a color shot of that swearing in. So uh, I was out there. I was probably the only photographer with color film in the camera. But, and I did try to talk my way on board, but there was no no way they were going to let me out. I wasn't there. <laughs> you you would have let me on, right? <laughs> so, so while this famous photograph, probably one of the most famous photographs of the 20th century, is being taken on board the plane, you were standing outside with color film in your camera, at the ready bottom, to go. At the bottom of the ramp. Oh, my goodness. Now, looking at a picture like this, this is the transition of power, uh, you know, in its rawest form. Mrs. Lyndon Johnson taking the oath of office, Judge Sarah T. Hughes, you see Malcolm Kilduff in the corner, Jack Valenti there in the corner. Uh, Julian, you weren't there for this, but, but what does this moment mean to you in terms of the assassination weekend and the importance of this smooth transition from Kennedy to Johnson? Well... I think it captures it all. In other words, here, the taking the oath with Mrs. Kennedy standing beside him, I think is the key for the transition or communicating the transition. And she agreed and wanted to do that. There was a lot of conversation about whether she would or she wouldn't, and she wanted to do it. So I think that's the key to the transition right there. Now, Julian, meanwhile, you are handling the press along with uh, Malcolm Kilduff there at uh, Parkland Hospital. This is a picture, actually, we decided from Sunday, but you were there all weekend. The governor was in surgery. He did survive his right. very serious gunshot wounds. Um, you're here with Governor Connolly's son, who's about to go to the funeral, right, for President Kennedy? This was... This was we, we were... We were doing, Kilduff and I were doing briefies all the time from the time that we set up a temporary press office there. And so we did several things, you know, for example, we, we'd, we would do updates. I had, I had the surgeon talk about when Governor Connolly's surgery was over. Mm -hmm. It came out and told everybody that, that, that the press was just waiting for every development. You know, they were sitting right there all day and all night for things. This happened to be, as I said, a couple of days later when we announced that Mrs. Conley, of course, could not attend the funeral services or do Washington. So she and the governor announced, or she announced for the governor, that John Conley III would be representing the family at the funeral. And that's what this is about. I was just announcing that that was part of the story because we were doing updates, you know, from time to time on everything that was going on. Now, and, excuse me, there's... There's a footnote to that. John the uh, Third went was was uh, asked by now President Johnson and Mrs. Johnson to stay at their house in Washington, and took him by the hand and made him front and center on everything that they attended throughout that time. Mm. Before we before we leave Dallas and talk about Lyndon Johnson and the bigger picture beyond '63. I want to highlight the Texas welcome dinner that was planned for Austin that night, the great uh, what might have been uh, dinner that evening. This is a program for that. Julian, you were instrumental in helping to plan this, the one political event of the Texas trip. And you have some thoughts on what may have happened that weekend had the assassination not taken place. Well, as I mentioned, we had five 
five events, and the only one that was to be a fundraiser was was in Austin that evening. The plan was they would leave they would leave Dallas, fly to Austin. There was a reception set up at the governor's mansion for all the members of the Texas legislature. You know, it was the hottest ticket in town. Everybody was all excited about it. We had 5,000 people bought tickets at $100 each in 1963 money to attend that big barbecue that night. When the word the president had been shot, two-thirds of the people had already come from all over the state and checked in their hotels. Nobody knows that because it was lost in the story. I, I have it in my book, but it's not generally understood what was planned to happen there. The, the caterer had done all the setup. Uh, everybody was having a big time to anticipating what was coming on. All of a sudden, everything went dead. At the ranch, the other thing people don't know is that the rest of the trip was to include their spending the night at the LBJ Ranch, west of Austin. And the preparations for that were unbelievable. I could tell you all afternoon about the, what they did to prepare for the president and first lady. You can imagine. This was the first time ever that President Johnson, or Vice President Johnson, had them as his guests on his own home ground. And there was a lot of hope and speculation that that would build a closer relationship between the two of them. So all that was, that was all planned. So what we ended up with was, was that, that night that everybody was heartbroken about. So the question was, what do we do with all these people who have come in from all over Texas for this high point of this trip? And now it's tragic. And a young state representative named Ben Barnes had the idea to have a prayer service at the Capitol. And that's what they did. They had a prayer service at the Capitol to sort of give some closure to people for a horrible night. So the next day would have been joyous and all the preparations made. They, they picked out several horses for the first lady to ride. She loved horses if she wanted to. Uh, they, they prepared uh, uh, all kinds of different food and drink for them, you know, that night. Uh, when they'd get out there for something to eat, snack later that night, all that. And one of the most tragic thoughts, as you all remember, the president had a terrible back problem, you know, all the time. And he had with him, they traveled with certain paraphernalia. I've never, you may know about this, whether they were boards or frame or something to give him more support in bed. They had made his bed for him except for that. And the butler out there, a gentleman that I talked to, had the bread all prepared, but was awaiting the arrival of the board that never got there. Let's talk a little bit about President Johnson. I love this picture. President Johnson, Vice President Humphrey, and there in the background, as it was probably throughout all of 1964, the uh, the image, the, the ghostly presence of John F. Kennedy. Walt... You were an eyewitness to this transition firsthand. I'd like to know how you think Johnson handled that transition, but also you and the rest of your agents, the Kennedy agents, the Johnson agents coming together. What was this transition like for the rest of you? It was difficult, but let, let me go back a little bit, back to Dallas for sure, a second. Sure, please. Uh, once, once the president was pronounced dead, the coroner showed up and said, you can't leave. Oh, yeah. Well, that didn't set too well with Jackie nor the Secret Service. We wanted to get them out of town. So anyway, the ambulance showed up, and we'd already bought a casket. Clint Hill went out and bought a casket. And as they're loading him into the ambulance, the coroner tried to prevent him from doing it. I, I don't want to say what happened to the coroner, but he disappeared. And, <laughs> and anyway, the guy driving the ambulance uh, was disappeared too because one of the agents drove the ambulance. They get to the they get to the plane, and the they're carrying the uh, the uh, the casket up the steps. Well, it didn't fit. They had to break the handles off the casket to get it on board, and it was just uh, it was it was a mess trying to get out of here. And in fact, the mayor the manager of Love Field said, "You can't leave." And they said, "Oh, really? Watch this." 
But uh, and years later, I met the manager of Love Field, and uh, he uh, he didn't like me because I was part of the Secret Service, and he still held a grudge against the fact that we took it, we took the body out of Love Field without all the proper dignity and all the laws that uh, was required to uh, remove a dead person from the city of Dallas. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Humphrey, and is that your question? Yeah, I'd like to know how you think Johnson handled this this transition uh, from the death of the president to his, his own presidency. Johnson was so much different than Kennedy. Kennedy was a Harvard guy. Johnson was a Texan from Sam Houston State. Uh, uh, both of them very bright men, but different. And uh, to say Johnson was sophisticated is probably an overstatement. He, would, he was a heck of a politician. And he, uh, it fell on him, and what he tried to do was continue some of the legacy of Kennedy, as difficult as it was, because they were not the closest of, of people. Uh, Bobby Kennedy was around at the time as the Attorney General. Lyndon and, and, and Bobby didn't get along at all. Bobby was kind of a, a, a little tyrant type of guy, very difficult to get along with, as was the President. But the president was so busy trying to get this whole thing back in order, uh, and he, he had a short fuse because he was trying to do the right thing. Uh, I, had, I gained a lot of respect for him as a man who uh, really tried to make things right for the country in a tragic time, uh, and he did a good job of it. Uh, he was a wonderful, he was a master politician. Uh, I mean, he would... Uh, He'd been known to curse at us once in a while, but if he wanted something, all oh, he'd rub your neck. Uh, so he, he was a master at it, and uh, he wasn't he wasn't as likable as as, as Kennedy was, but uh, he uh, he did the best he could under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Vietnam War is what uh, was what really brought him down. Speaking of, of Vietnam, here's a here's a picture from inauguration day in 1965. There's. Vice President Humphrey and Walt, there you are on the far right. You switched over to the vice presidential detail, and you ended up going to Vietnam with Vice President Humphrey five times. That's right. I was promoted to the what they call the agent in charge of the detail, and I had the vice president's detail. So I left the White House, went across the street to the EOB where the vice president office was. But uh, and then the Vietnam War was starting to heat up. And uh, we see a few demonstrators, and then it kept getting worse and worse to where Johnson really had difficulty traveling because of so many demonstrators and anti-Vietnam people. So we went. Uh, all these teeth are caps, by the way, from some, uh, some happy hippie knocking them out. But anyway, uh, we went to Vietnam five times. Uh, in fact, one night... We went over for the inauguration of one of the trips to the inauguration of Key and Two, the president and the vice president. And we went to the inauguration, and that night there was a, a reception at the Blue House, at their White House. And we're standing in line, uh, automobile line, people are getting out. And, we're, and I'm in the front seat of the car, and it was a circular driveway that you go around to get out. And we're sitting there for what seemed an eternity to me in a war zone. It was probably three or four minutes. And I said to the driver, go the other way. So we're going against the grain in a political situation. And Humphrey, he didn't curse very often, but he was cursed at me that night. He said, you know, you're embarrassing me. I'm the vice president of the United States, blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know, that's fine. I'm sorry, but you know, this is what we're going to do. As soon as we got him out of the car and up on the front steps and into the house, the, t the two cars behind us were hit with rockets and everybody was killed. Wow. So good Lord was looking after us, I think, because there was, there was a person waiting for a, it was for him. And uh, very difficult times. And uh, we traveled all over the world with him, and every place we went, between Peace Corps people and all that stuff, draft dodgers, uh, we, uh, it was a difficult time. Mm -hmm. Eamon, uh, here in Texas, you continued to cover President Johnson. This is a really interesting picture here. Tell us what's happening. Well, the, uh, the Johnson was vice president at the time. Right. <clears throat> this was a small jet that ran off the taxiway and got stuck in the mud. So. Uh, yeah, we can see the dirt down there on the ground. Yeah, we went out to shoot it. 
So I, I, I got out before they opened the door. They opened the door and out came some people. And then came then the Johnson carrying his laundry, <laughs> and he, and he was, a little, I was shooting with a longer lens, so he was shouting at me something, but I didn't know what he was saying. I just kept shooting, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> as he's telling me to stop, but I, I didn't. I just kept going. Anyway, um, he strode. He finally very quickly approached me, and I, I, I thought he was going to punch me out because he was really angry. And, and the reason he was angry is he didn't like being photographed with his glasses on. And he said, I told you not to do that, to take me pictures. <laughs> then he said something else, and then he said, what, what's your name? And I said, Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's, that's when it got more difficult, <laughs> because he, he thought I was putting him on. And, and the, the, the reporter said, no, no, Mr. Vice President, his, his name really is Kennedy. <laughs> Now, now between the two, you took lots of pictures of both Kennedy and Johnson. Which mm -hmm. one? Obviously, I think we could all agree that President Kennedy's the more photogenic. But as far as a subject, who was the most interesting of the two? From a photographic point of view, I, I, I suppose Johnson because he was erratic. You know, <laughs> it was uh, he would do things that would make news. One but, more uh, picture you took in, in in later years of the whole family there. That was at Love Field, and I'm not sure. I think they were all passing through and decided to meet up. And um, there were some pictures in a conference room, too, and then this was in a hallway. I'm not sure. But uh, it was just a family gathering. Happier times for you and President Johnson, though, than oh, yeah. from that last picture. Yeah, I want to get to the conversation part of our community conversation, but I want to end with an image like this, which I love. Lyndon Johnson... Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy here. Uh, Julian, would you say that civil rights was the defining moment of, of Johnson's presidency? Yes. Uh, for years and years, Vietnam was the dark cloud over Johnson's legacy. <clears throat> and all of his... Uh, friends and supporters agonized over that. That remains a scar. There's no question about that. But the civil rights story has received much more attention in the last few years. And there was a very large and significant forum held at the LBJ Library about how long ago? Two years ago? Yeah, 2014. Two years ago. That went into the whole story had five presidents attended that. And much more emphasis was given to the entire civil rights story. And I think all historians agree that that helped balance the legacy a great deal. And I think that nowadays, it's even beginning to get more attention by thoughtful writers when we see efforts intensifying to roll back the civil rights program in this country. So, yes, I would say uh, the civil rights thing uh, was very important to his legacy and the fact that he pulled it off. <clears throat> and, of course, you can go to the LBJ library and hear tapes, you know, all the things that were going on in this, in this uh, period of time. Mm -hmm. And you haven't done that, and if you have an opportunity to do so, I would recommend that you, that you do that. Well, I want to give you a chance to ask some questions of our panel and the, the different areas they, uh, they represent and experience that weekend. So we have a microphone up here since we are recording. This will ask you to just step up to the mic and you can ask your question of any or all three of these uh, distinguished individuals. Hi, I was at Love Field the day of the assassination. Um, Texas law requires all murder victims, no matter who they are, to have a court... Uh, uh, a proper uh, autopsy. Um, we all know that Texas law was not followed nor respected. Um, the fellow who would have done the autopsy in, on President Kennedy, had he been allowed to do so, had done hundreds of murder victims and would probably have done a much, much better job 
than the autopsy that was given in Washington. I have yet to hear one single coroner tell me that was a good autopsy done in Washington. In fact, they've all said the opposite. It was totally botched. Could you comment on that? Well, Walt, you, uh, you talked a little I, bit about the process to getting the president's remains back to Washington. It, it, it was a political decision to take him out of here, and I, I didn't try to make light of it when I mentioned it earlier. It just, it just happened. She insisted that we leave, and I have no idea uh, about the uh, autopsy in Washington, whether it was good, bad, or indifferent. I don't know. I'm sorry. I wish I didn't know more about it, but I don't. But As I understand it, it you know, Mrs. Kennedy certainly didn't want to leave the body of her husband in Dallas, and Lyndon Johnson, as you have, have, have all three stated, we want to get him a, out of town. such an astute politician, I think he recognized the importance of not leaving the widow of the president here in Dallas. So Johnson's attitude would be to mm -hmm, take right. Mrs. Kennedy and the body of her husband and get back to Dallas, because at this moment, no one had any idea what sort of international plot uh, this may have been. And Johnson, I think, at um, Parkland Hospital even expressed that he was afraid that his own life could be in danger. Well, he, you got to remember, nobody knew at that point what this was. Right? Yeah. There was a real concern about this. It might be a coup of some sort. Yeah, or, at the height of the Cold oh, War. Oh, yeah. It's just high, that's correct. So everybody was on edge. Yeah. And he did the right thing. He knew he needs to get out of there and back to the White House. No question about it. There are several more aspects to that question you raised. Uh, there are a lot of people who say that the reason they wanted to get him out of town is a, a proper aut autopsy, and I'm not trying to judge whether it's proper or not, uh, would, would confirm that he had Addison's disease, which had been charged against him over years and years, and they'd always denied it. I think my, my analysis of it, and given all the factors involved, it was one of those times when you really learned that federal federal overrules state and legal. At mm -hmm. some point when push comes to shove, federal does it. And to argue about whether it was right later. Mm. Another thing with, with Kennedy, he always wore a back brace because he was yeah. hurt in the Second World War. And the first shot went through his, the knot in it from the back, through the knot in his tie. That may or may not have killed him, but the fact is because he couldn't bend over, he didn't fall forward, he couldn't fall down in the seat because of the back brace. And uh, I'm sure that that had a lot to do with the second shot being so accurate. We have another question over here. Hi. <coughs> I'm from Boston and a very active member of the library there. So this is a very good experience for me. Wonderful. Uh, I saw a documentary about the Secret Service. And I want you to tell me if it's true that but for 25 years they did not discuss this. And then they had a documentary where they tried to say that um, at that time there were very few people in the Secret Service who were helping the president. Is that true or not? Well, it wasn't our place to discuss it. It was investigated by a congressional committee. Oh, okay. And uh, you know, I have opinions about it that people who were there tell me. I don't know if they're correct or not. But uh, I mean, there are people tell you organized crime is behind it or you know, all kinds of, uh, of uh, reasons. Like Oswald, uh, here's a guy who renounces, he got dishonorable discharge from the military, got uh, dishonorable discharge, renounced his American citizenship, moved to Russia, married a Russian girl, had two Russian children, and all of a sudden he's back in Dallas, Texas. People at the State Department tell me that they don't think he came back to the State Department. I don't know if that's true or not. However, if it is true, how did he get back? Who brought him back? Why was he here? I don't know the answer to all those things. But uh, there's a lot of mystery about Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, she also was asking about the size of the, the Secret Service uh, as far as the White House detail compared to, say, today. It was quite a bit smaller, as I understand it. Oh, yeah. There, the size of the Secret Service when I was in is equivalent to the number of agents assigned to the White House today. Uh, we probably had less than 500 agents before the assassination. There's probably that many assigned to the White House. Uh, I don't know what the hell they do, but uh, with that many people. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but anyway, that's, that's what it is. And, uh, Any other questions at the microphone here? 
No? Well, our guests will be around during the reception, so if you want to approach them one-on-one, -on -one, I'm sure they'd be happy to talk to you. Please join me in thanking this panel for sharing your stories with us.